Tosca, thank you so much for joining us on Real History. Thank you so much for having me. I think a really good place to start off is an introduction of your latest book. You are a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, you've written a number of acclaimed works. And your latest one is a collaboration with uh, an author who has been on our show before, and that is Marcus Brotherton, who uh, has a gift for writing both fiction and nonfiction. Not many people can pull that off convincingly. And so he's one of those rare breeds of author who can do that. Um, perhaps you can tell us uh, a little bit first about your collaboration with him and how you uh, created this really moving story uh, set during one of the darkest episodes of World War II. Thank you. I would love to. So The Long March Home is a story about the World War II in the Philippines and the Bataan Death March that results from it. Um, how we got I'll, how we got started, I'll tell you that part before we jump into what the book's about, but um, I've known Marcus for years. I've known him for over a decade, and many years ago, I endorsed a novel of his called Feast for Thieves, which went on to win awards, and it's a beautiful novel. Um, in 2017, Marcus called me and said, hey, listen, I've been working on this kind of back burner project about the Bataan Death March, three best friends who are stationed in the Philippines and become part of the Allied Surrender and part of the Bataan Death March. Um, I feel like I'd really like a co-author in the process, and would you like to come on board? And I have to be honest, I, I had not heard of the Bataan Death March before. And I do write historical fiction, but my historical fiction has been 2,000, 3,000 or more years in the past. And so this is really new history for me. And I was much more familiar with the European theater than the Pacific theater. And so Marcus launched into this, you know, explanation of, of what, what had happened, what was going on. And um, I said, this, this sounds like a, a great story. And, and more importantly, it sounds like an important story. And other people like me who have not heard about this chapter of World War II history, should learn about it in what better way than learning through a novel because one of the most important things that fiction does and this was this is why Marcus who's probably best known for his World War II biographies and nonfiction, wanted to tackle this in a fiction uh, way is because it it immerses you into the narrative so you're not just reading about it you're not just studying it you're living it and this story happens in first person present tense and so you're right in the thick of it mm -hmm. and so I said yes let's do it this was 2017 and he had already been working on it for seven years wow I added five years to the process so this is a novel 12 years in the making um we get asked all the time how do writers write a novel together don't you fight a lot and things like that and the answer to, to that is every partnership is different uh in this instance, Marcus did something that I think is very rare. He handed over his uh, manuscript that he had, his draft. He handed over his research. He sent me books. And as I started my own research process and started to dig into what he had, he stepped out of the way and he said, make it your own, do with it what you will. And this kind of open-handed approach, I think, is extremely rare, shows a great deal of trust, and also gave me the freedom to be my best as a writer. That's a, a great collaborative story. As, <laughs> as, you were, uh, as you were doing your research and as you were taking readers back to this, frankly, hellish setting. Yeah, absolutely. What was one of the most surprising or inspirational aspects that you uncovered or recreated as the story evolved? Well, first of all, that anybody survived. So... Oh. This is the story of outmanned, outgunned, outsupplied U allied Filipino U.S. forces, um, where it was a battle of logistics as much as anything. Um, they're starving. They're, well, let me back up. December 7th, Pearl Harbor's bombed. Within 10 hours of that, uh, the Philippines is bombed as well. So immediately plunged into war. That's the part that that I did not know and was not aware of. 
they're plunged into war starting December 8th. Manila falls to, in uh, January 2nd of 1942. The Allied surrender, which is the largest American surrender in history, happens April 9th of 1942. So this is the story of these three best friends going through events uh, that are just, as you said, hellish because they're fighting without food. They're, they're fighting without ammunition, without supplies. Those who survive the war then become POWs. And then they are marched 60 miles from the Bataan Peninsula to the POW camp, 60 miles in six days, already starving. And if you stop for a drink of water, if you stop to eat anything, uh, even to try to drink out of a carabao, water bu buffalo wallow, which the water's brackish and not fit anyway. But, you know, when you're thirsty, you're thirsty. Um, you're bayoneted or you're shot or you're beheaded. And so anyone who survived the war and then survived that death march, as it's come to be called, uh, and enters POW life, it's the beginning of 41 months of POW life. And so mm -hmm. the fact that anyone could survive to talk about it years later is, is a miracle. It's a testament to um, the human spirit. It's a testament to brotherhood that kept so many of those men alive. And so that's the most surprising thing I'd say. The second most surprising thing is so many of these soldiers were boys. Mm -hmm. um, there were boys who were teenagers. There, there was boys who were um, who lied about their age to enlist. We have you know documented cases of fourteen year olds who went in to uh, who were stationed in the Philippines with the thirty first Infantry, mm -hmm. and uh, were POWs when they were 15 even, and our main character was 18. Mm. I have 18-year-old twins, and for me to fathom my boys in this situation is, is I can't even. So I would say that's one of the hardest things, and the research was so many survivor accounts, and mm -hmm. so many of these survivors never talked about their experiences until much later in life, if they talked at all, or if they wrote about it or recorded it. And um, the research was absolutely harrowing and um, and also tremendously inspirational as well. Absolutely. And the, the story hits close to home for me as well. Uh, I had uh, an uncle uh, who was a survivor of the Philippines, and he was likewise imprisoned for a number of years. He was with the Philippine scouts. Luckily, oh. he was not part of the death march. He was captured shortly thereafter, if memory serves correctly. Uh, but it was something that never left him. Uh, and I think, and I suspect, uh, that's something that your book will get into, not only the, the physical scars, but the emotional scars as well. So things like that simply never leave you. Absolutely. And they didn't have the, you know, the verbiage that we do today, where we mm -hmm. call it PTSD. It was shell shock or survivor's remorse. Um, those Philippine scouts, by the way, they were they were badass guys. I mean, those guys were um, they were in it for life and they they knew what they were doing and and they were the ones who um, thank goodness for them. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that serves as a good segue for considering how the Bataan experience has been depicted in cinema. We are a history versus Hollywood channel after all. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's worthwhile to think about some of the, the cinematic depictions of yeah. what your characters endured. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of the movies about Bataan, and not just the, the soldiers, but also the nurses, uh, mm -hmm. happened in the 40s. And um, the Office of War Information was very involved with uh, what came out of Hollywood around that topic. Um, in 1942, there was a victory short, and it was called Letter from Bataan. It was put out by Paramount. And it was about two soldiers in the jungles of Bataan. And one gets killed, and the other one's wounded. And he's on his deathbed, and he writes home begging his family to conserve and ration to prevent death of soldiers in the field. So it was very much um, a form of propaganda. And the idea was that, um, and, and this is recorded, the, the OWI basically said, you know, the best way to propagandize people is through entertainment because then they don't realize they, they're being propagandized. 
um, the first wartime movie with Batan and it was um, was released at the urging of the Office of War Information. And it was called Batan. It was put out in 1943. And it was about three heroes who stay behind to blow a bridge. I can't remember if that was the Kelumpet Bridge. Um, but they fight a delaying action. And so it's the story of these heroes who buy 96 priceless days with their lives. Um, and the whole movie was shot in a studio. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea was not that this was a defeat, but that this was a strategy. Um, and it was a strategy to delay the Japanese advance and to make victories possible in New Guinea and uh, Midway and Guadalcanal. And then there were a couple movies with the nurses of Bataan, mm -hmm. who have now become known as the Angels of Bataan. Um, so proudly we hail, I think that was 1943, and also Cry Havoc. So proudly we hail had a uh, Veronica Lee in it. And um, it was considered one of the first great love stories of our girls at the fighting front. And um, and so it was a it was based on a, a memoir by one of the nurses called I Served on Batan. Cry Havoc was about nine nurses who were uh, bracing for the Japanese attack and and the idea in this movie was to rouse the sense of defiance and the sense of uh, rousing women to the, the war cause. Um, and then, of course, there was back to, to Batan with uh, um, uh, John Wayne. And uh, it's where he stays behind to lead this uh, guerrilla resistance. And, um, and then, of course, there was uh, they were expendable. But that mm -hmm. happened in 1945 after, yeah. after the fact. Yeah. yeah, so it was kind of glamorized and it was kind of um, used as propaganda, actually, to paint this as uh, not the surrender, the defeat that it could have been portrayed as. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you you hit a chord because one of the fundamental components of propaganda is anger. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to agitate the American public about Japanese atrocity, there was certainly no better example to invoke or to recreate than yeah. what happened in Bataan and within the Philippines. Um, yeah. So that is something that is very poignant. And it's undoubtedly why so many movies of the 1940s were a reflection of that as well. Mm -hmm. So on a slightly brighter note, um, <laughs> your, your co-author... Uh, made a really interesting pitch um, for, for you to come on the show, and I really liked it. I thought it was really, really creative and, and thinking outside the box. Um, and so the, the two of you came up with an idea to, to share what you think are the best war movies for date nights. <laughs> and I anxiously await uh, your conclusions. Uh, after pondering this okay well let's discuss i i i'm probably not um i'm i'm not very typical in that i i i enjoy war movies um i i i don't always like the uh romantic movies but i i'm thinking through this and i'm trying to think of some more movies that may also have a romantic through line to them and so i'm going to think of this from the distant past leading up to the front okay um so thinking back in time i have to start with gladiator it's not war it's kind of war adjacent but it's got a lot of fighting in it um it also has a romantic um kind of storyline in it um it's got a great soundtrack and it's got russell crowe so what else do you want <laughs> Um, moving a little forward in history, and I really like ancient warfare. I mean, that's kind of mm -hmm. where I'm most comfortable. Right. I'm the girl who went to see the 300 two times in the first two days that it was out back to back. So there you go. I'm a bit of a nerd that way. I mean, I went to Thermopylae. Um, I went and visited, and it was a little bit of a pilgrimage for me. So yeah. a little different. Probably. Well, I think uh, that that's a, a big point uh, because even though something like 300 it's certainly not an accurate movie from an, uh, a historical no, it's based on a comic but i mean but uh <laughs> but you know i think you're you're a prime example of what movies 
can inspire people to do uh go and visit places maybe pick up a book and learn a little bit more about it so Absolutely. i don't think that's outlandish at all well it was gates of fire by uh, stephen pressfield um was the book that i i fell in love with so that's what drove me to see the movie twice in the first two days and then eventually that's what drove me to go to thermopylae and see where this epic battle had taken place and you know where the immortals had fought the spartans and and so i was um I really like that. And, you know, I don't feel like date like date night movies have to be romantic to be good date night movies. Um, they can inspire the human spirit and give you a lot to talk about, especially if you're dating a prospective someone you might want to spend time with. So mm -hmm. um, I have to add to my list Braveheart. Um, it's it's an inspiring movie. Um, I am half Scottish, so I have to put that out there. The other half of me is Korean, so you'd never guess I'm half Scottish, but um, there's a romantic storyline there and about William Wallace, and he's um, you know fighting the tyranny of King Edward. And um, I have to add Rob Roy, who was in 18th century Scotland, and uh, Jessica Lang's in that one, and there is mm -hmm. definitely a romantic, you know, they're already married. Liam uh, Neeson's in that there. one, correct? Sorry? Liam Neeson's in that one. That's Liam Neeson, yeah. yeah. No, so, right. and it ends with an epic sword fight, um, a great sword fight. So if you really like a good fight scene, uh, that's a good one. Uh, early America, I have to say Last of the Mohicans. Oh, yeah. Gotta get Daniel Day-Lewis and Madeline Stowe, who you don't see a lot of anymore. I'm not sure where she is, um, but I've always been a fan of her. And I think that for... Uh, viewers who are fans of Outlander, this is a really good movie because there's this whole kind of Mohican storyline in Outlander too. So um, Outlander fans would probably really like Last of the Mohicans and it's got a killer soundtrack. Oh, one of the best. Yeah. That's one of the ones that I went out and I bought on CD. <laughs> so, and I, I've written a lot to it actually, because I, you know, I, there's, I can never get rid of that, um, the scene of Daniel Day-Lewis running. He runs a lot in this movie. He's like the early Tom Cruise, and the soundtrack's fabulous. I, I have to add, too, if we're going to talk about World War II, uh, Hacksaw Ridge. Hmm. Um, Andrew Garfield as Desmond Doss, who's a pacifist. Um, there's a very slight romantic storyline, and mm -hmm. it is a very gritty, very grueling story. Mm -hmm. It's a very redemptive story, um, and it's another one of those that um, is really a testament to the human spirit. And um, so I have to add that, and also the Thin Red Line, um, which is a story with uh, Jim Caviezel, and it's Guadalcanal, and it's a war movie, but it's it's got beautiful scenes in it mm -hmm. interspersed between the war there's this narrative happen in the background and and i'll never forget when he shoots a guy he says I, i've killed a man that's the mm -hmm. worst thing you can do and and nobody's going to stop me you know who can do anything about it and so he's got this narrative running in the back of his head and it's a really thought-provoking film but there's also these scenes of the people and moments of, of real beauty that contrast the war I agree. Okay. I think uh, the Thin Red Line. It's a very philosophical movie. It is very philosophical. Uh, it is uh, spiritual, and there's a lot of different ways you can define the sort of spiritualism. Uh, and yeah. it, there's uh, religious. There's nature. There's uh, thoughts on humankind, uh, yeah. man's ability to give life or take life. Um, and it it's it's a movie that has some mixed reactions among veterans who I've spoken to, but I, I agree with you that it's uh, cinematic merits uh, are, are really the, the reason to tune into it. As an author, it it's haunted me, and it, it has definitely impacted my writing of, of books like The Long March Home. Hacksaw Ridge did that also. Um, you know, The Long March Home is not a story exactly like either one of those, but this humanity and the string of humanity and those moments of beauty in between um, have definitely stayed with me. So, uh, and I have to add Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck and mm -hmm. um, Josh, what, what was that guy? Hartnett. Hartnett, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, because and it's so Hollywood and it's so <laughs> Hollywood. But that it is. <laughs> but it's Josh Hartnett. Forget Ben Affleck. It's Josh Hartnett. And and for many of us, that was the first time we saw Josh Hartnett. And mm -hmm. there's that wonderful scene in the the parachute hangar. And um so that's a that's a beautiful movie, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel when, like uh, it's very Hollywood, but yes, yes, very much so. Yeah, when uh, when I was when I was in school, when when that came out, uh, Josh Hartnett was the the heartthrob of all my female teenage classmates. <laughs> uh, that was one of the things that uh, I remembered best. And I saw that movie in theaters, and it was say what you will about its historical accuracy or lack thereof. It was quite the spectacle to see on yeah. on the big screen, and uh, really, what they were trying to do is they were trying to make a 1940s formula love story in the same fashion as Titanic. Uh, and who yeah. could blame them for trying to replicate this? Hey, you know what? Something right? like Titanic. It's not three hours long, but it was it was the first time so many of us saw Josh Hartnett, and it was really. Um, it was it was interesting to see it also from a nurse's perspective too because you don't you don't often get that absolutely um, so and then um, learning about the last mission into China and that 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 was the first way I heard about that so that was mm -hmm. really interesting to me so I'm kind of out at that point those are kind of my go to war you know I mean I had so many war movies I love platoon um, so many others but I wouldn't call that one a date night pick per se <laughs> probably not yeah wait a few more dates don't certainly don't make wait it a few more dates first. get more popcorn yeah yeah absolutely yeah. well Tosca I think you've offered us some great food for thought and you've given us a really good list of not only date night movies but I think you've also illustrated how movies can serve as a gateway for broader understanding broader conversation and a further reading and research so we can understand what really happened in these Absolutely. historical incidents. And you do the exact same thing with your historical novels as well. So uh, before we head out, uh, give us one more plug for your book and tell your readers, uh, our readers and listeners here, uh, what that book is and mm -hmm. where they can get it. It's The Long March Home, the story of three best friends who are stationed in the Philippines with the 31st Infantry. They're from Mobile, Alabama, and we do have a dual, a dual timeline to give us a brief reprieve every now and then from the, the grit of the war. Um, it's available anywhere books are sold. It is out now, and um, I hope you'll read it. All right, folks, there you have it. Go check out the book. I don't think you will be disappointed. So, Tosca, thank you so much for joining us on Real History. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. I hope we can have you back again sometime. I would love to. All right, folks, that covers it for this episode of Real History. We'll see you next time. And until then, stay curious. <laughs>